Hi, my name is Steve, and welcome to part two of Building Your Own Garage and Save Money. You know, over the last year or so, I've had a lot of questions about building materials, techniques, paperwork, how I did this or that. So what I wanted to do was start from the very beginning and talk about the paperwork required in the entire process of building this garage. Later on in the video, I'm going to take some clips of the foundation, uh, walls, doors, headers, the roofing, a lot of stuff on the trusses because people seem to think that they're very hard to put up when in fact it's one of the easiest parts of the garage. And I guess the first step I did was I went to the local Home Depot and I told them, hey, I'm interested in this garage, 24 by 24, the two nine-foot doors and one side door, which is a very basic standard garage. And they have software in their computer that they will punch in what you're looking for and it will turn out a small blueprint. And that's where people ask me, you know, do you have blueprints to build this by? And I really know all I had was their, I don't know if you'd call it a rough blueprint, it wasn't much, but it did give a materials list which you're going to need. And the material list will list off every board in this place. The roofing, the trusses, uh, because that your material list is what they're going to deliver to your house. So anyways, I took my building list, I took my blueprint, and I also got a plot plan of my yard because you will need a plot plan when you go to the building inspector. And those are available from your assessor's office or the town hall, or you may have one with your deed, I'm not sure. But the town hall can put you in the right direction. And all a plot plan is, is like a, a small blueprint of your yard. It'll show your boundary lines, uh, where your house is located on the property, maybe your septic tank, other outbuildings, such like that, so that when you go to the building inspector for your permit, he's going to ask you where you're putting this garage, and you pretty much draw a picture on the plot plan, and he will make sure that uh, you're within zoning requirements. In my town, we have a 12-foot, uh, what's that called, a 12-foot setback, where I have to be 12 foot from my neighbor's property line. So when all the paperwork is with your building inspector, he'll come out, you'll stake out approximately where you want your garage, and he'll just make sure that you are, in fact, you know, within zoning. And the next step, I called a concrete construction company, told them what I wanted to build, and these guys have probably done a thousand garages just like mine, so they're very familiar with it. Uh, they send a foreman out, and he will stake out the property. You know, you can tell them. I also had, when the concrete people were here, they obviously bring a, a good-sized bucket loader. And I had them remove a lot of stumps and stuff and small trees that were going to be growing up right behind my garage that I wanted all taken out. So I had that all done at the same time. And uh, they come out, do a little surveying to square up your garage where you want it. And then the guys do the bucket loader work. They put in the forms for the footings. Concrete truck comes, does the footings. After a day or so, they'll come and they form the walls, put the forms up for the walls. In the meantime, the building inspector will come. After the footings are done, the building inspector will come and check on them, and he'll also come back when the walls are complete. And a lot of people have asked me, they go, oh, my building inspector, you know, he's here giving me a hassle. And mine was a really nice guy. I don't really know him well at all. But the reason he told me he was here, he goes, I'm not here to bother you. He goes, I'm here to make sure that that construction company is doing their job. That's the only reason. He goes, I don't want the foundation issues down the road. So he goes, I'm going to inspect it and make sure that everything is done right. So that was it. Uh, I got my permit from him. 
I contacted the construction company that does the concrete work, and they came, and I had the foundation and the floor all put in. So then I contacted Home Depot, and I made arrangements. They delivered everything on one giant trailer truck. And that was the roofing, all the boards were arranged and pallets. They had the two by fours on one. I also got like some 12 and 16 foot two by fours too. And uh, roofing materials, garage doors, whatever you've ordered. And my trusses came on another truck, a tractor trailer, and they lift them off, set them in your driveway or wherever you want them. I would get everything close by because it'll save you some walking. And then uh, I just started. When I started, a lot of people go, I can't believe you built that in two weeks. Well, I did, but I worked from seven in the morning, probably till seven at night for two weeks straight. I had taken my vacation and that's how I blew a whole summer of vacation. And whether it takes you two weeks or three weeks or two months, it's all the same. You don't have to be as fast as I was or kill yourself doing this, just take your time and you'll be fine. One fringe benefit of building your own garage that's hard to put a value on is the satisfaction of knowing that you've done it yourself. Uh, you know, when my friends come over, they ask, you know, hey, who built your garage? And you go, I built my garage. And everybody is, is kind of amazed, and I know it sounds kind of stupid, but I'm actually very proud of this garage. You know, it's one project that I actually did from start to finish, and when I look around, I remember doing everything on it. You know, I remember putting up the trusses and the headers, and uh, I would recommend it for anyone. I did have my wife and son help me. Uh, you know, we carried stuff together. Nothing is terribly heavy, but some things are awkward and you're going to need a hand holding up some board while you nail the other end. And uh, I don't have any special tools. I have, you know, hammers. I have an old table saw. I have a handheld skill saw. And uh, I did have a nail gun, as I talked about in the original video. I have a nail gun, two nail guns, one for the plywood sheathing and a stud gun which is used for the, the two by fours. Also the smaller gun which for the sheathing is also a roofing gun. And I guess you could do everything by hand but the cost of one is well worth it. You can go on uh, Craigslist or things like that. You don't have to run out and buy a, the newest everything. You know, I just got a used one and it uh, worked fine for the whole project. So anyways, the bottom line is don't be afraid to take on a project like this. And I don't mean that in a sarcastical way that you're scared to do this. I just mean a lot of people feel intimidated because they look at the, the completed project, you know, at your neighbors or you'll drive by some place and there's a construction crew putting up a building in three days or something. Just take your time. Uh, there's a million things of information on the internet, whether it's a video like this or, you know, they have detailed videos where people are building walls and trusses and it's not a big thing at all. So anyways, I've made a small thing of all the different steps that we're going to go into. Sorry this is turning into such a long video, but it's hard to explain it. You can't show how to build a garage within three minutes. So if it's going to run 30 minutes or more, what can I say? Okay, this is the garage as it stands today. Uh, it's all sided. I've added a few bushes a couple years ago. They've grown really fast. I don't know in the original if I had this deck put on. That's a just a little 14 inch high deck. And uh, the siding actually matches my house. Let's see. 
spot. I put it in the same orientation as my house is, squared up to my house. So, anyways, let's move inside and we'll get down to the details. This is a shot of the foundation, the wall of the foundation, how much it sticks up. It's about six inches high. It goes into the ground four foot, and underneath that is the footing. And uh, one reason that I wanted the wall foundation versus a, a flat pad is because the pad would start down here. And then I get the bug issues, and I'll go into that more when we go outside. I'll show you some shots of the outside of the foundation. But after the wall was poured, the floor is four inches thick, and this is called the floating floor, typical to a wall style foundation. And the floating floor means that in reality, if the ground swells during the winter time, the floor can actually rise up and sink down. Maybe only a quarter of an inch, maybe not at all. But it prevents it from cracking because it does have a little give to it. So it's not actually connected to this wall right here. It's poured right up against it, but the floor is a separate piece by itself. Let's go outside and I'll show you more about why I wanted the wall foundation versus the pad. So this is the foundation wall right here. As you can see, I probably have a good six inches of wall showing before the actual building. The sill plate would be right about here on the inside. And uh, this is one advantage over people who build their garages or houses on a slab because the slab will only come up just maybe an inch or so over ground level, maybe two inches, but over time it'll sink down a bit and then the soil will be right up against the sill plate almost. And you know, and then you're gonna get the ants and the bugs and especially the water rot because the water will seep up a bit, ruin the sill plate and then it's all downhill from there. So anyways, I spent the extra money and I had the wall put in straight down four foot and uh, that's about one reason why I did it was simply to keep the rot out of there, the insects and the water rot. Hey. This is the side window that I put in, a little of the siding. A lot of people ask about the electric. And I have two uh, inlets for underground wiring. One of them I don't use. The larger one I don't use. And I thought in the future that someday I may want a welder or something like that that would require a 50 amp circuit. So right now it's empty, but uh, the other one, I have one 30 amp circuit going to it underground. Uh, comes from inside my house. Buried four foot down through that PVC pipe comes up inside and I have a small circuit box inside. Uh, this is a shot of the roof. Kinda high. I can't get up any higher. But these are architectural shingles and I do these myself. I've never even done another roof before so yeah, I just read a few books and stuff like that. Asked a bunch of questions and uh, it wasn't too bad. Took me a few days to do this, but I did have a nail gun, which was really helpful. So that's a shot of that. And I came underneath when I did the, the trim on the inside. I used some vinyl siding that I bought down the local hardware store, Home Depot. I made some little shelves for it to sit on and it came out okay. I have a little different style at my actual house. He did a flat cut. Mine's angled right up under the trusses. Okay, back inside for the wall construction. Again, foundation. And the first thing I put down, very hard to see, but there's a, a pink strip right under here, which is a piece of foam. It 
keeps the insects out, kind of weather tights it. And uh, that goes right, you just trim that right off after the walls are up. It's about 12 inches wide, comes in a roll. And this first board right here, I use pressure treated lumber for this. And uh, people have asked, well, how's that held down? When the walls are poured, uh, every four foot, they have a, a half inch threaded rod that's embedded into the concrete while it's still wet. It goes down about, oh, maybe a foot and a half, has an L shape on the bottom. And the rod will stick up directly in the center of the 2x4. If you're using 2x6 construction, they will move them over a little more so that they're always centered right in the 2x4 of the sill plate. And all you do is lay the sill plate up against it, mark it with a pencil, get the measurement from the edge over this way, drill a hole, put the board over. I countersink this first board with an inch and a half uh, Forstner bit to bring that down so when I screw it on, I, a big washer or a nut hold it right down. Then you just cut them off with a sawzall or a hacksaw because they do stick up about this high. So just cut them to length after it's all bolted down. Then this board, the next sill plate, whether you do your, I had done my walls ahead of time by laying them down. I, uh, I built my walls and then I stood them right up on top of the bottom sill plate and they're nailed in every 12 inches. I have double nails back and forth in multiple directions to hold it right down. Uh, some states might have an anchoring system with some metal bands. I wasn't required to do that so this is it and this is the 2x4 wall. Let me zoom up and I'll show you the top. A lot of people had questions on the trusses, how they went up. Pretty simple actually. I'm going to zoom the camera up in a minute, but we started by all the walls were up and I had marked the top plates where I wanted the uh, trusses to go. So anyways, what I did was carry them in. That's where I had my wife and my son help me. They're on one end, I'm on the other. And they're not very heavy. We're talking maybe 40, 50 pounds, I don't even think of 50 pounds, probably 40 pounds a piece at best. And we carried them and stacked them all down to this end, but hanging upside down. So the, the peak of the truss was actually hanging down this way. And we pushed them in one by one, we carry them in and pushed them right up against the wall here. And then starting down the other end, let me add one thing first. There's the trusses and then there's two extra called the gable ends. And I'll show you. Let me zoom up here. You see the very first truss on the end of the building on both ends is called the gable end. It's a little different than the other trusses. The exact same measurements, the outside angle of the peak and everything. It's just a different construction. You might want to take note of the uh, the vertical uprights on it, which the main trusses just don't have. I'll get a better shot of that in a minute, but while I have the camera set up, I wanted to explain about the trusses more. On the outside of the building, before the two gable ends go up, because those are first, I take some long 2x4s and right on the outside of the wall, I run them right up in the air. Oh, they stick up maybe six, seven feet. You know, you can have longer ones, it doesn't matter. And I do like four of them, a couple near the center, one at each end. And the reason for that is, when I carry up the gable end, because that one I'm going to do first, this one and, and then the front half, they're identical. I want something so that when I tip that up, it doesn't, A, fall over, but most importantly, it'll keep it completely vertical with the wall. So I can nail that one all in. I do the front one, 
secure that one all to the wall, the top plate. And then, the reason for that is, is because my trusses are 24 inch on center, which means that they're spaced 24 inches apart, unlike the walls, which are 16. Now, I can measure each side of the wall 24 inches out, but I won't know where the top is. So that once I have my gable end and I know that's completely straight, I have my trusses all stacked up on this end. I drag one down, and this is again where I needed some help. <clears throat> I had my wife on one side and my son on the other, and I just take a pole and I put a hook on the end. I made a little hook out of a piece of metal. I used an old pole from a skimmer from my swimming pool. I just hook it on the peak that's hanging down, tip it straight up in the air. <clears throat> then I get my ladder out. I have them move each side to my marks where I want the trusses to be on the top plate. And then at the very top, I measure over with my tape measure while I'm holding it, 24 inches, and I just take a piece of wood <clears throat> and tack it in place, referencing off the gable end. The next one goes up exactly the same. I drag another one down, flip it up, have them hold the ends, I get up on top, measure out the 24 on center, take another piece of wood, tack it in place. <clears throat> Excuse me. The reason you do that is because after all the sides are secured, I roughly, I may be a quarter inch off, a half inch off, it'll be okay. When I start doing my plywood, I'm going to go back up, pull out the nails. I don't pound them all the way in. I just do it enough to hold the peak of the trusses in position. Once I start doing the plywood on the roof, though, the trusses have to be straight. And if it's been damp out, if you had them delivered on a Monday and they're all banded together, if you cut the bands off, within a few hours they start to get a little wave to them from the humidity that they've absorbed. A little trick if you, when they deliver them, make sure you have some uh, old pieces of wood, some two by fours. You don't want them laid right on the ground. I laid mine right on my uh, tar driveway, but I laid down strips of two by four. That way it would, if it rained, you know, I could cover them up, but they wouldn't soak up any more moisture than they already have. They are notorious for warping. Now, let me show you some stuff on the plywood. One thing that's very important is when you put up the plywood, the very first piece that you put on is the most important piece of wood that you're going to put on this garage because everything references off that one piece. And a good way to tell when you're done, the building itself it's 24 foot long. So I have alongside every wall, if I have a piece of plywood that's sticking out this far or it's on a little bit of an angle, somewhere I've screwed up. So this one came out really good because as I went up the plywood on the roof, every piece was right square to the gable ends. I never had any overhang that I had to shave off or put in a trim piece to fill in. And I've seen a lot of garages built by the pros and that's what they did. So, bear with me here. When you put on the first piece, I had some help. Uh, my brother-in-law came over and uh, because I couldn't hold it up there, all I had was two ladders. I don't have scaffolding and all that stuff. I'm, you know, as cheap as they come. So we got up on our ladders and I measured and measured and tacked it in place in case I had to move it. Because as you add more pieces on, you'll be able to tell if you've messed up or not. But I never had to, uh, I guess, rearrange that first piece of plywood. The same on this side. That first board is the most important one, the first sheet of plywood. That one has to be square to the gable end and the ends of the trusses. The trusses, the ends of the trusses, I don't know if they're 100% accurate. You could, you could shave them off a little. 
but I want it very square to the gable end because the gable end is square to everything in the roof. And after I had my first row on, and then it gets really simple. After the first pieces are on, then it's all downhill from there. Throw up another piece, tack it on, three pieces, 24 foot. I did it on this side too. And that gave me something to work off of because then I could slide another piece up right on top of that one and go. I do have some things. Let me zoom up here for a sec. Hard to see, but right between, if you can see the crack between the plywood sheets, there's little pieces of metal. Those are called plywood ties. And what they do is, when the first piece of plywood is put up, when the first piece of plywood is put up, you install the ties between the trusses. And all that does is, if the roof gets uh, moisture from inside your garage, like today, it is hot and humid out. Where normally the boards might want to tend to flex like this between the studs, you only have 24 inch between, excuse me, the trusses, you only have 24 inches anyways. But that will keep the roof nice and flat. There'll be no bowing, one made bow, vice versa, the other. So that little tie will keep them right together. I don't know if that's code. I know my brother-in-law had a garage professionally built at his house about 15 years ago, and they don't have them. And his plywood sheets on his roof are actually, you can see the bow in them. And these haven't done it at all. So, and a bag of them must cost about four or five bucks. So, hey, money well spent. I did have... My building inspector wanted me to add a few things. <clears throat> I'll show you. Get, change positions here. This right here is called a catwalk, and it goes right down the center. That stabilizes the horizontal bottom piece of the truss. And I also came out probably five, six feet and I have a smaller one. That's a two by four that runs down. A two by four that runs down that side. The one right in the center is a two by six. It also it also gave me a place to run my wiring. I run my wiring right down the center of the catwalk, split off. I don't know if you noticed, they have uh, five lights and an outlet for a garage door opener. I'll show you a picture of that. Bear with me on my camera work because I'm, I'll tell you, I tried, uh, if you notice the first segment's a little different where I'm talking because I had some issues in my family. My brother-in-law had a large fire and uh, just, I've been helping other people and I just haven't had a chance to finish it. But I did about 25 takes and finally I just gave up. I went, I can't do it. It's funny, in the original it was just one shot. I sat down and narrated through. And so on this segment here, I don't care if I screw up. You know, you can just bear with me and if I'm that revolting, I'll hit the off button and go someplace else, I guess. But I'm trying my best here, so bear with me. I noticed in the summertime, the place really fills in with stuff. I have lawnmowers and motorcycles and stuff like that. And in the wintertime, I usually put them someplace else, uh, another little building or something like that to store because I, I park in here. I do wish, when I had originally made it, instead of the 24 by 24, I wish I had gone to 28 foot long. That extra four feet would have really been helpful uh, you know, for lawnmowers and stuff like that. I have a Jeep which is pretty short and I can pack everything in here and pull in and it's okay. But for the extra, you know, it probably would have been four or five hundred dollars tops to add another four foot on here. That's just, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six sheets of plywood, give or take, and a little extra concrete. 
the guys are here already, you know, for them to add one more four foot section is nothing. Mistake on my part, I wish I had gone bigger. It looked huge when I first built this. I walked in going, oh man, this is great. And now the place is just filled up with junk. You know, every wall has ladders and shovels and hammocks and uh, toolboxes, you name it, I have it. And uh, so it might be something you want to think about is go big. Go as big as you can because you'll never be sorry. I'll share the garage door here. Let me turn around here. doors. I had never done one of those before. The first one took me about all day to put in. It came with a, a VHS thing, so I had to find an old VHS player, which I didn't own. But anyways, after the first one went in, to do the other side is about, you know, a two-hour project, two, three hours. It wasn't a big deal. I'll show you a few details. You want to see. They don't come with a few things. Uh, I bought those angled pieces with the holes drilled in them from a local hardware store. And uh, exact same thing on this side. That's where they hang down. And uh, they're mounted. And I don't know what more to say. You know, if you follow the video, the doors go in pretty easy. The rails go on first. And then, uh, you know, the doors slide in place, everything's bolted together. So it worked out pretty good. On the inside of the header, uh, again, that's the gable end. Gable end truss comes down on top of the top plates. Those are jack studs. The next board down running horizontal is the header for the garage doors. It's partially covered up because I have a board, a two by six board that frames it for my garage doors because my openings are nine foot, but my doors are nine foot also. So you have to build in to get, let me move on to the other side. I get a better view. Excuse my photography work. Right here, if I can point, is my nine foot opening. So I have this board right here, a trim board, which actually, if I can look right down, my door, nine foot wide, but I have to have something for my door to touch up against to seal it. Some people put a rubber seal there. I didn't feel it was necessary. Mine fit very good right up against them. I don't have an air space. Come down. I have little sensors on the bottom of the door that come with it. You know what's funny? The doors were probably one of the most expensive things running, oh, 400 bucks a pop. So I have $800 worth of doors. And I didn't realize till after I bought them another mistake I made. I'll try to tell you my mistakes because I've made several. You know, you probably know that already. But my doors are two inch thick insulated doors. And I, but my garage isn't insulated. So that was just stupid on my part. You know, the guy sold them to me and uh, I didn't realize it till after I'd put it up. I've never, never done a garage door. Here are my corners. As you can see, I have a, uh, Overbuilt them as a lot of carpenters have pointed out. I didn't need that much. I only needed two two by fours mine have four and my Those are hurricane ties right there Those tie down the trusses although the trusses are nailed down 
they uh, will require that by code. Okay, now we're way up in the trusses here. That's the gable end, way down there. View of my catwalk, uh, trusses, the roof. There's one of the, uh, the plywood ties right there between the things. When I did my roof, a lot of people use a ridge vent, which is, uh, there's an opening in the top of the roof. The ridge vent goes over, allows ventilation to come up. I really didn't think I needed one, but so I just uh, put the shingles on top of it. But when I made the roof, I cut my last section. I left about an inch and a quarter space so that if I wanted to go up there and take off that top row of shingles on the peak, I could cut that tar paper and install a ridge vent and the heat would go up through it. But usually my garage is opened up. It's not insulated, so... I don't have that big of a heat problem in here. Not something I'd worry about. This is the brace I made to the gable end comes down. That was just an idea I had. It wasn't required. Probably see it down the other end I have one too. And uh, it's just the inner workings of the trusses. But not much else to say about that. Again, here's the gable end. Here's the gable end sitting right on the top plate. Again, this is my top plate right here. The gable end is, is nailed right down. I nailed on both sides. And I have some ties near the ends. Can't get a picture of them from here. When I did outside, I, I dug around it a bit, dug down, put landscaping fabric, and I picked up, uh, they're called Red Rock, three-quarter inch Red Rock. It's uh, native to this area in New England. Uh, nothing special. But anyways, I wanted to keep the, try to keep the weeds down. So <clears throat> here's the back of the garage right here. And uh, again, there's my foundation. I kind of like that sticking up. I can show you what my house looks like if you want. And you can compare the two. So you check out this piece right here. As you can see, my house is right almost on the ground. So I get the green mildew and stuff. I have to power wash that off. But this is typical of a house, you know, in this in New England and stuff that was built. This is a uh, you know 115 years, 120 years old right now. So it's still holding up good. The foundation is still good. It's a rock foundation. And uh, the sill plates are all good. I've done some work to those. Some sections needed to be cut out and replaced, but I've done a lot of work to this. You guys want to take a little tour of the inside and see some projects? Because I'm about all done with the garage. To start off, uh, a while ago we put on... Let me move back. This was an additional uh, outbuilding that they put on the house in addition to it. Originally, I don't believe the house had a bathroom. It probably had an outhouse back then in the 1800s. So when they added plumbing, they extended the foundation, put on this building. It's a little entryway. The other half is a bathroom. So years ago, again, my wife and I had did the foundation ourselves, did all the walls and stuff. And uh, I paid a guy to custom make me some trusses because I'll show you inside what we did. The ceiling height in the bathroom was very low, and in the entranceway, it was just a straight across shot for the trusses. So, we had these raised trusses put in. He made them for me. It wasn't, you know, we're talking a low, low amount of money. But I had taken off all the roofing, installed the new ones there. So it raised up the ceiling a, a good amount, especially it really helpful in the bathroom, because I'm pretty tall anyway, so. And uh, over the years, here's I'll run through a few of my projects. I put in this door here. I made that. Uh, everything in the house, we did ourselves. I did this floor. I put in new floor joists. I needed a good uh, 2 by 12 floor joist if you're going to go with the tile floor. Because if there's any sag to it or bounce, it'll just crack. And this is held up pretty good. And over that, it's a one-inch plywood. And on top of that, it's the half-inch cement board. 
and then the uh, tiles go right on there. That was just something new for us. We had never done that before either. So, continuing on with the tour. Ah, I've done my kitchen floor several times. It's just linoleum. Uh, had some new cabinets put in. Kitchen cabinets. The bathroom. The bathroom's all been done over. I had an old tub in there. We got rid of the tub, did a stand-up shower unit, uh, the built-in mirror. Again, the raised ceiling, because that really helps in here. The ceiling, the original ceiling height was this high, which was about seven foot high. So now it must be a good eight and a half foot ceiling. So that really came out pretty good. I put this beam in right here, the center beam. It had, somebody had taken that out. And uh, it's a 14-foot span, and they had an old tobacco pole with no center support in there. So I worked down in the cellar. I put one down there, uh, support right under that main beam there, right in the center. And I couldn't even get a carpenter to help me on that one. Nobody wanted anything to do with that. But that was about oh, 15 years ago, and it's held up pretty good. We did the floors over. The original fur floors. I did this Anderson Bay window. Uh, have a pellet stove. As you can see, my extra uh, tiles. I made this little hearth for this pellet stove to sit on. We've done every single window in the house. Every window was replaced about 20 years ago. Did this door here. This was a major undertaking here. This is the stairs that go. To the second floor and uh, this was all stripped out and mind you the whole house was horsehair plaster which if you've ever dealt with that you know how messy it would be and that's a high ceiling too so the whole stairs the the treads the stringers everything was replaced that was about three years ago I'm not sure another room here that one's been done over A lot of mess. All my kids have moved out, so it's in a bunch of spare rooms here. This is, a, they're very small rooms in old houses like this. But these have all been done over the floors. Got a spare bed in there and stuff piled up. But it's pretty good. I had grandkids that stay over and uh, another spare room. This one came out pretty good. It has two identical rooms on the other side of the house. And uh, over the years, we've had, I did pay a plumber to do my entire plumbing over. Guy lives down the street. Here's a picture my mom painted. My mom passed away uh, about three years ago. My mom painted that. My wife's really into the whole quilting thing, makes these, you know, wall hangings, stuff like that. And I got another one there. I did this room over myself, too. Another horsehair plaster job that all had to come out. Anyways, that's about a tour of the place. Anyways, that's about it for me, for part two anyways. I don't know if there'll be a part three, unless I get a lot of requests or something. But anyways, thanks for watching, if you actually stayed through the whole thing and watched. And you know, for the people who say, well, where did you learn these things? Well, when I gave you the tour of the house, I've owned this place since the early 80s. and. Uh, I just started small, you know, a window, a doorway, things like that, you know, and just, just built up to it, but you needn't be afraid of doing a garage if that's your intention, you know. Just take your time and everything will come out fine. Hey, thanks for watching. See you later.